Welcome to the Molding Health Show. Our goal is to leverage the wisdom and experience of our healthcare practitioners to set you on a path of self-discovery and healing. These insights, coupled with a multidisciplinary approach to each area of interest, should provide an invaluable resource to everyone looking for a better approach to health. In this episode, we speak to Shelley Hall, a clinical psychologist based in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, about BWRT. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's show on molding health. We're going to be discussing a fairly interesting uh, therapeutic approach called brainwave recursive therapy with clinical psychologist um, Shelley Hall. Shelley, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So, Shelley, uh, in today's topic, we are going to be discussing a little bit about um, brainwave recursive therapy. I've been hearing about this, you know, if you're looking on the internet and so on, there are a lot of practitioners that say, you know, they're BWRT certified. Could you tell us a little bit more about what BWRT is? With absolute pleasure. It's a really, really fantastic brand new therapy. It is based in neuroscience and it was developed by Terence Watts in the UK. So it's very much a solution focused therapy. It doesn't require any practicing of strategies. Um, Terence Watts looked at a, someone called Benjamin Libet in the early 80s, his work, and his experiments had proved that we don't need free will. We don't have free will, rather, in the way we think of it. So the way I like to explain it is your brain is essentially like a computer. The computer has a whole lot of programs. It gets an information, just like your eyes, ears, bodies get information. And the computer's got to match it up. It's got to decide, is this an email? Is this a photograph? And once it's done that, it then gives the responses. So your brain is just the same. Gets information very, very quickly. It's got to sort it all out. And it's going to decide what you're going to think, what you're going to feel, what you're going to do. So within a split second, it's done all of that. And you are responding. Once the action is in process, we can then try and quickly stop ourselves if we don't like what our brain has given us to do, but there's no real conscious control of that impulse as it's arising in the first place. So you can say BWRT, that's for short, much easier to say. It works directly in that a cognitive gap before conscious awareness. I know it's quite a lot of information are you no. following me? With yeah, yeah. I, I was just kind of a bit thrown with that. You know, if we don't have free will in the way that we think we do. But when you explain it yeah. like that, like a computer, it does make sense. You know, you get an image in, but the computer then has to look, you know, is this PNG? Is this JPEG? Is this actually an HTML <laughs> email? And make all of that decisions in a split second and give you the feedback. So, yeah. Yeah, um, and very... And I'm sure you've had that experience before where you've, the common one is anger. You know, you're getting really angry with someone and then you realize, I don't want to be like this. And you're trying to pull that anger back in, but that response has happened. And the next time, the same thing again. So this is pretty, pretty powerful because it actually works before that response. So most of your, of that comes in the amygdala, very, very deep in the brain but BWRT works way before then. BWRT goes way back to the back of the brain here, what we call the reptilian complex. That's animal parts of the brain that is always the first to respond, that's trying to allow us to survive. So it's always looking for threats and it's triggering our responses. You've all heard of that fight, flight or freeze. So we're working right there to actually stop the response from happening. So you, or in common terms, you guys are really working in the lizard brain. You know, you're working at that real base of, you know, that survival mode part of the brain way before you get to the logic and, you know, that side of the brain. So how would BWRT actually work in a clinical setting? I mean, you know, when we're talking about the brain, um, most people immediately assume, you know, neurosurgeries and that kind of thing. But, <laughs> you know, 
you know, how do you, uh, from a clinical psychologist perspective, actually put brainwave recursive therapy into action and actually start teaching people how to use that to prevent those, you know, sudden flash anger responses? Well, it's absolutely beautiful. It's quite simple. There's no why as as such involved. We're not hooking you up to anything. (laughs) So basically we work through what people want to change. So I might find out when I'm conceptualizing somebody, because I always do that first before I use any kind of therapy. Uh, What are the past traumas? Where are they feeling they're getting stuck? What is triggering the anxiety? What is triggering the depression? And sometimes we might even make a list. And then you would directly target those things on the the person's list. Um, So you don't teach them the technique. You actually use the technique in the therapy session. So it uses the the engine of BWRT as very, very natural because it's got that naturally occurring freeze response. We use the freeze response, but a synthetic version of it, which we induce therapeutically and without any trauma. So we then use just your normal communication processes of that early brain to reorganize and neutralize the responses. Um, So very much say that anger example again, where every time you see your boss, you feel that anger rising, we would work with one of your memories of a time when you got angry, we would induce the freeze response. And then this is the best part for me, you as the client choose how you want to feel, how you want to think, how you want to respond. So it's not hypnosis where I'm giving you a suggestion and then you put my, get your suggestion stuck in your brain or however you'd like to put it. So you would actually create the response and then we use our little process. We don't tell you exactly how we do it, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> and a few minutes later, guess what? You've got this whole new response. So every time your brain now receives that same kind of information, you're not even going to think about it. There's no snapping yourself with an elastic band or whatever it is. It's very, very organic. Your brain's automatically going to go, ah, oh, right, that file, access that file, give you that response that you have created. Sounds unbelievable but I can tell you now it really really works it's changed the way I practice completely look I I can only imagine that it would definitely work I mean so from personal experience and I don't know if this was maybe you know neurotypical being my brain kind of learning a behavior but I'll never forget after my younger sister died um you know, I have this thing, you know, if somebody touches my shoulder and goes, how are you doing? I immediately almost get defensive. You know, um, I didn't do that as a youngster. So somewhere along the line, obviously my lizard brain must've connected that touching my shoulder and going, how are you doing? I was immediately pulling in going, well, how do you think I'm doing? My baby sister just died. And even to this day, you know, it, it's that natural that that immediate defensive response. So without actually realizing, it's my brain made that connection, and that's what you guys are really doing in BWRT. Is you're saying, you know, how do I change that snap anger or snap defensive decision to go? Hang on, freeze. Maybe you want to respond to this differently. Yes. So we would, we'd, you know, we'd get you to make a picture of how you want to feel and respond when someone touches your shoulder. It's, it's literally that simple. Okay, Very so, nice. yeah, I mean, because, well, let's be fair, I think a lot of us actually teach our lizard brains certain behaviors, obviously through the years as we grow up and, you know, don't have the ability to be able to reteach them and that's where something like BWRT would come in so what's interesting sorry what's interesting as well is that some of our programs we actually have from our genetics as well from our you think of how sexual abuse is often a pattern within families so sometimes our patterns of responses have actually come from even our family's experiences or sometimes we don't have one if you've got no experience of trauma and you get hijacked, that's why people get those flashbacks and they get the re-experiencing because they literally, the brain goes, 
what do I do with this information? How, how do I file it? I can't match it up. So BWRT lets you create this nice little file for it and then it's done. That memory, that really traumatizing memory, you know it happened, but it now means as much as your hair or your eye color, there's, there's no emotional response associated with it anymore. Yeah, I, I'm actually really intrigued by what you said there because I was watching something recently about um, elephants and um, genetic memory. So, you know, I would assume that, as you say, in humans, we have the same thing. Um, if sexual abuse is something that happens in families, then yeah, it gets passed from generation to generation. Same as memories. So, you know, if you really think about it, elephants know don't eat that berry because you're going to get sick. But they know that from like little, which means they were born with that memory. So, yeah, I would assume then that from a human perspective as well, if you know, you're in an, if you've grown up in, or your family's been in, let, let's say a war-torn environment, you yes. naturally and instinctively are going to be kind of more cautious than somebody who'd grown up in a really luxurious environment because that genetic memory is being passed up. So it's already there and having something like BWRT kind of starts to help you go, actually, actually I'm not living in a war zone. I don't need to be Super cautious. Yeah. Mm. That's yeah. absolutely yeah. phenomenal. So how would you, so BWRT obviously does differ from things like cognitive behavioral therapy because you're working so much earlier. It's not that conscious decision to change behavior. Yes. And it's this with, with CBT and a lot of those other therapies, you've got to learn skills. You've got to realize when you're in one of those states to then put the skill in action. You've got to go and find all the thoughts and feelings, things that you're wanting to change. There's quite a lot more work. And yes, those therapies do work and they really do suit some people probably better than BWRT for some reason. But this for me, it works a lot faster. So you don't need as many sessions. And for, also as a patient, you feel it instantly. Uh, the number of times, because you work with your eyes closed with BWRT, just because we're asking you to imagine things, so it's easier. Number of times when we're done, the client opens their eyes and they're like, they literally go like this. They're like, oh, I, I, can't, I can't believe, I, I feel so much lighter. Or sometimes even during the process, I'll see them kind of moving and you can just almost <laughs> imagine the stuff sort of physically detoxing from their bodies because there's just such a sense of release. So if it hasn't worked for some reason, we also know immediately. And like I say, there's no going home and rehearsing. And a lot of times, which is slightly frustrating on my part, is someone doesn't always realize that the change has even occurred because it's that natural. Yeah, I, I must imagine that that would be a bit almost frustrating <laughs> from a psychologist's point of view is that you know the change is there. You can see in there. <laughs> behaviors that it's there but the person actually doesn't realize that something's changed you know um well they, they'll put it down to something else you know <laughs> oh it must be that my medication kicked in no nope, it takes at least two weeks for some of those meds i think it was bwrt <laughs> i once even had a client who had a fear of heights and they came to see me and started chatting about something else and i was like whoa wait hang on what happened to that fear of heights and they're like I'd completely forgotten about that. And this weekend I was actually up in the orange tree picking oranges. I didn't even think of it again. So that's quite, it's just yeah, mind blowing. So would you ever use BWRT in conjunction with something like CBT or would they be completely separated? No, com completely separated. We don't, we don't really like to mix other, like you would never mix say hypnosis and BWRT. We okay. try and keep them quite quite separate. Sometimes you might work more cognitively if you sense there's resistance because any therapy in the world, when there is resistance, whether it's conscious or subconscious, it's not going to work. So sometimes you've got to work cognitively with somebody a little bit first or provide some psychoeducation. Like say if someone's had a loss, a family member's committed suicide and they're feeling a lot of guilt around that we might need to work a little bit cognitively first to help the person understand why, what suicide is and why people do that. 
before we are able to use our grief protocol and help them to let go. Okay, so yeah, but that does make sense. You know, if you're resistant to something, you're not actually going to be able to make the changes needed. So, you know, you would need to first work on the resistance in order to work on the next step to make the change. Um, yes. So you said earlier that you know, whenever somebody comes in, you kind of do almost a, a, a breakdown. You, you know, you see who the person is, what their past histories and traumas and that kind of stuff are. Um, to almost make build a model of who this person could be from there, would you then set out a therapeutic plan? You know, there might be a couple of things that need to be changed and then kind of look at, okay, so this is the most pressing. We start there and work down, or is it yeah. far more natural kind of whatever's coming up at the time? You know, for me, and I'm always very grateful to Prof. Gertie Pretorius. She's one of my mentors and she, I've done some fantastic courses with her. But one thing I've really learned with Prof, you know, therapy is not, the client walks in the door, sits down and you go, so how are you? How was your week? It shouldn't be that. You must have goals, in my opinion. You must have goals and you're working towards those goals. Otherwise, like we were saying in the previous episode, your client's going to be on your couch for years and you're going to be sort of just dawdling around because you don't have specific goals so I like to conceptualize and then we reach an agreement and of course sometimes things might pop up and then we can add those to our goal list add more sessions if we need to or sometimes you might find with BWRT especially because your pathways are connected we can have a list of 10 things and has a knock on and actually knock some of those things off your list, even though you didn't work on them directly. So in that way, it is organic, but I always do try to conceptualize and we agree on what it is we're going to be doing. Well, that makes so much sense. You, you know, um, if I look at anything that I do, you know, I always set out kind of why am I doing this and what do I want out of it? So I would assume it would make the same sort of sense from a therapeutic process is to actually have those goals. Otherwise, like you say, I'm going to be seeing my therapist for the next 30 years because we're not actually working towards something. Um, so, uh, but I liked what you said there about that almost knock on effect that maybe there's 10 things that we want to work on, but you know, a couple of them might actually be intermingled. So working on the one might actually relieve the others. I think you've pretty much covered most of what we wanted to get out. It's such a fascinating mm -hmm. field that happens so quickly and without people actually realizing how fast it works. Is there anything else you can tell me about the um, brainwave recursive therapy that would actually help the public to be a little bit more aware of what their treatment options could be to deal with issues? So um, just also to add that it is also applicable to children. In South Africa, I run a training course for psychologists who are working with children. It really works very, very nicely. But BWRT is quite diverse. And we have three levels of training. Level one, we use for just more phobias, anxieties, traumas, um, performance anxiety. If you have a lot of anxiety before you write a test or oral, that sort of thing. So it can knock out a lot of stuff, OCD, PTSD. And then we have level two. And level two is far more for deep-seated things like gambling, porn addiction, basically where you're wanting to make a core identity change. So sort of a change to your personality in some ways, we would use level two. And that is very, very structured. That's over four sessions. You've got homework between the sessions. It's really, really nice. Then level three is with psychoneuroimmunology, neuro big long word, and that's far more working with, with actual some physical kind of illnesses. Um, I haven't done that training personally for level three, but uh, level one and two are pretty, pretty powerful. So the big thing for me with BWRT is that you can feel the effects immediately. Far fewer sessions are required. And you as a client are far more in control because you're actually choosing how you're wanting to respond to events. And I think that that's pretty powerful. It's putting the therapy process into your hands in many ways. 
Yeah, so it's almost it, it's almost giving you that control of shaping yourself into the person that you want to be instead of just kind of aimlessly wandering around and I, I actually it is so fascinating to know that for everything over the years in the growth of mental health and treating mental health just how far we've come from mm -hmm. you know lobotomies to actually being able to help people with a thing like BWRT to get over some of those early traumas or that anxiety or those phobias of, like you said, the, the client who was scared of heights and without actually realizing or thinking about it is climbing a tree picking oranges. I mean, that's life changing, yes. but it's life changing in a way that your life is better without you actually, you know, having to go for plastic surgery kind of case, you know, you feel better about yourself without actually having to go and make manual, you are making manual changes, but you're making changes in a way that don't require somebody putting a spike in your yes, yes. frontal lobe. And originally it was, it was actually called contentless therapy. Um, because we don't need to get all the details, which I think is really lovely for the therapist as well, because it's quite easy for us to get traumatized too. So when a trauma has oh. happened, you don't need to give me all the details out loud. I'm going to ask you to see it in your mind when I need you to do the process, but you don't actually have to tell me any, all of it. So that's also quite powerful. Again, you know, putting the therapy in the client's hands to some extent. I think that's I absolutely think, amazing. This has South got African to be a context, game changer. It has. Our South African context, we know there's so much crime and so much trauma. And BWRT has made trauma, and I don't want to take away from the victims at all, but it's made trauma easy for us and a big relief for us. Because you come in, the sooner you come and see us, the better. We can take that trauma out of your mind. So it's just like any other memory. It no longer bothers you. You don't need to go on to develop acute stress disorder and PTSD. We can literally stop it in its tracks with this therapy. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. You know, just the sheer volume of people that a therapy like this would be able to help. Um, you know, if you look at where we currently are in the country, um, you know, we're in Gauteng. And I must admit at the moment, it is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> You know, on the first two waves, they they were numbers. You know, now it's kind of names. And I got a couple of friends that do work in you know the hospitals, and you actually watching this the physical effect of that exhaustion and just that trauma of you know seeing death upon death upon death you know, that there is, there is something that they can go, you know, they can go to counseling and get something to help them almost if I can just file there, this well. trauma instead of Sorry. reliving it every day. Yeah. Sorry. You were jumping, and then jumping over you a little bit with the Zoom delay. Um, it's, I work with a lot of security guards who have been involved in cash heists. And I had one that came back to me the one day and after another heist, and he said he was actually just coming back to tell me how well the therapy had worked. Because you're creating that file, you know, with our healthcare professionals who are seeing these traumas over and over and over again, going forward, once they've done this process, their brain has a response. So they don't get as burnt out. They're able to empathize, do whatever they need to do, and move on a lot faster, which they really are all needing in this. Yeah, I know a lot of I've worked with quite a few professionals who unfortunately they're in ICU and they discover somebody has passed away in their bed and that happens multiple times. Mm -hmm. So it does, it's leading to very high levels of burnout. And I must yeah. give credit to Rafiq Lockhart, our South African BWRT trainer. He developed the most wonderful protocol for grief. It's actually called the loving goodbye. It doesn't take grief away. But it takes away those negative emotions that often stop us from grieving. So your guilt, your anger. So it allows us to work through that. And then we can have that goodbye for the person 
and go through the grieving process. It's really quite beautiful. Very, very powerful stuff. Yeah, um, look, I must admit that anything that can help people actually go through that grieving process in a healthy way has got to be amazing because I think so many people just don't actually know how to handle grief, you know, and yeah, you get the anger, you get the guilt, you get the the denial, um, you know, we get the run to the pub for two years and be blind drunk because we don't want to deal with these kind of things. So, you know, I, I do think if somebody has lost a loved one or, you know, reach out and see if there's somebody who can help you actually process and process the grief and go through those emotions, you know, in a healthy, secure way. Okay. Um, thank you. This was absolutely phenomenal and so informative. Um, it's amazing to know that there are therapies out there that can have, like you say, that instantaneous effect um, and just that weight lifted off people when that feeling of anxiety or fear is actually removed. It, it sounds absolutely phenomenal. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat to us. My absolute pleasure. I'm really and passionate about this stuff, as you can probably see. So just, it's just changed the way I work and just gives me such hope for my patients. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share it with everybody. Hundreds. So Shelley, if anybody wanted to reach out to you to make an appointment, um, we will put all of your contact information in the show notes at the end of this. You guys, please, if you are feeling in any way that you do need some help, please don't hesitate to reach out to Shelley or look on our directory for a practitioner in your area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. As always, Stay tuned and we'll speak to you in the next episode.